Greetings. Uh, this is an unusual session of the Future Transform. We uh, had to reschedule a guest, so at the last minute decided to improvise a session on the subject of how to best teach online. Um, and so rather than having one guest anchor the discussion, uh, we instead just basically let the conversation flow organically from within the Future Transform community. So what you'll see in this recording first is a really short intro before the program began. <clears throat> I put the uh, topic to the um, community and asked what they'd like, and eventually some of them surfaced some really good topics. So we have that. And then a few minutes later, uh, we begin. So this is just a quick intro to let you know that this uh, Future Transform session is a little bit different. Love to hear what you think in the notes. Thanks. Bye-bye. Uh, so I'm asking people if they would like us to either have a session or to hold a session, uh, a free session about the topic itself, which is teaching well online. And the author, Airman, uh, just gave us one start for the latter. And uh, Melanie Hogue uh, from Southwestern University in Texas, where it's a little bit warmer than it is here, um, just uh, she had an observation uh, from a discussion. I was just wondering if you could share that. Uh, now? Oh, please go ahead. Just see okay, what I'm not used to being on stage. You're great. Great of it. Look at this. Uh, we had a diversity and belonging session yesterday for anybody that wanted to attend on campus. Uh, it was primarily aimed for the teaching space and for our students and for students of, of color or marginalized. And uh, one of the things that stuck out to me that I had not thought about was. Uh, the perception is or can be of students of color, uh, having a camera on can be perceived by them as being watched in a much more stronger context than a white students. And that struck me. And I asked for some information and, and follow up at the end. And uh, it's a real thing. The person presenting it, uh, presenting the session, ex uh, her, she shared her own experiences um, of those type of feelings. And I just thought it was an interesting thing uh, when the the discussion about students need to have that type, the students need to have their cameras on, we need to provide them a flexibility. And I just thought of this as another thing to consider, particularly in being flexible, whether they leave them on or off. So it was just an observation. And I just wanted to share that. Maybe it's not new, but I just wanted, it, it struck me. Well, thank you so much. That's a great, great point. Um, we're about one minute from starting the event itself. Can I can I just put that in a list of things to talk about? It's it's your thing. <laughs> well, but it's it's your idea that you brought to us. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Welcome to the stage, uh, friends. We'll start in about thirty seconds. Um, Steve, can I keep you on for a minute? Sure. Uh, if you're just joining us. Uh, so folks like Andrew, Kim, Kate, uh, Lorna, Liz, Tom, Eric, another Tom, Christina, Kenneth, Nessa, Gloria, Aimee, and, um, we are um, right now just without uh, our guest. Uh, our guest had to cancel just a few minutes ago. So I was putting to the community a choice. Uh, should we cancel today's session flat out or instead have a discussion about the topic our guest was going to address, which is teaching online. And in the past few minutes, two, uh, Melanie Hogue and uh, Steve each put forth two ideas for a second, uh, two things to talk about. Uh, how universities support uh, teaching online and what they can do about it. And the is um, the uh, question of how people of color may feel surveyed uh, experience. Uh, so I would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, I'm going to, in about 30 seconds, have to introduce the program itself uh, in the usual fashion. but. Um, if you would like to keep us going for this next hour, uh, speaking of teaching well online, um, your thoughts either in the text chat, click the raised hand button and I'll show you how to do that. Uh, David, thank you for your support. I appreciate that. And Helen, that's a good question. A very good question. Well, here, let me, um, as people come in, let me, uh, let me do our normal introduction so people can understand a bit more about the program and so forth. Hey, Brian. Hi. Hello, Tom. Hey. Please go ahead. Yeah, since, since I was probably one of the early instigators in pushing 
<laughs> Professor Laurel Art into this a little bit. Um, what if we had some discussion about uh, the, some of her ideas and, and how they impact what we're trying to do right now? I mean, I've been working on some stuff myself around uh, adapting her ideas uh, for uh, the current circumstances, you know, the conversational frameworks in particular. Uh, and obviously we were doing some work with Arizona State on the uh, tool sets and also connecting that up as well. So I'm happy to contribute there. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, that's a great idea. I have just put you down on the list and we will come back to you. Okay. Thank you, Tom. I will step off for a moment. Uh, and and Steve, I'll put you off right now. Uh, Good. Just introduce people. Um, because it is the top of the hour and I would like to begin. And for those who have not been to the Future Trends Forum before, or those who haven't been here for a while, let me introduce it and let me welcome you all. Again, my name is Brian Alexander. I'm the Future Trends Forum's creator. I'm its host, I'm its cat herder. And for the next hour, it looks like we're gonna be exploring how we can teach well online, both in terms of what practices enable that to happen, as well as how institutions can support them. About 15 minutes ago, I put to all of you the question, should we cancel today's session or should we have a discussion about how to teach well online? And enough people suggested versions of the latter that I think we can do that. So what I'd like to do is improvise, and we are always happy to improvise here in the Future Trends Forum, um, and to talk about how to teach well online. And we have a few different folks who have raised key points about that. So just let me just stress, this is organic, this is free-flowing. I've got a couple of ideas I'm gonna to put to you all, but you all are a fantastic brain trust of experience, of vision, of criticism, and of practice. And so we would love, love, love to hear from you. Uh, to begin with, uh, I'm gonna bring Steve Ehrman up on stage because he was the first one off the blocks and he had a great, great question or an observation or a topic for us to examine. I think he has a story to share as well about that. And we'd love to hear from all of you. Uh, a few of you have also come up with more ideas, uh, including the awesome Tom Hames, the awesome Helen Williams, and the equally awesome um, uh, Melanie Hogue, and we'll bring you guys up. And as we go, we'll have more topics. Consider this an experiment that we're doing live, building the plane in midair. And to help us co-pilot and engineer it all, they bring Steve Ehrman up on stage. Thanks, Brian. Thank uh, the story that I wanted to tell has to do with the University of Central Florida. It's one of a number of institutions I've been doing research on over the last four or five years. And they're doing, um, as far as I can tell, a really first-rate job at trying to assure that uh, their teaching online and their teaching in blended courses is exceptionally effective and that they have data um, to back that up. But what I wanted to talk about uh, just for a moment is historically, how did that come to be? And the story goes back about 20 years, uh, at a time when they uh, faculty in one school, the School of Education, offered a first online course uh, to school educators uh, around the state. And the person who designed the course, Steve Sorg, did a really good job of incorporating an awful lot of active and collaborative learning in this graduate course, treating the students as agents who would be doing things and uh, learning to test their conjectures for themselves, trying out ideas from the class in their own schools and so on. Uh, not, that, not long after, uh, Joel Hartman, who was the then and the very long time CIO of UCF, uh, notified Sorg that there were there were just starting discussions around UCF about so what are we going to do with this online thing? And um, Sorg and his colleagues made a presentation to the to the, especially to the deans and senior academic administrators that so impressed them that they thought, a this is good we should do this. Uh, it can we can offer a superior level of instruction. And, um, and pull in students that we wouldn't otherwise be able to get. Uh, and furthermore, this is the way it should be going forward. 
you know, maybe it was a happy accident that Sorg started this way, but it's not going to be an accident going forward. We need to take steps to make sure that these courses are just as good in every way, uh, at least, as courses that someone might take on campus. Mm -hmm. And just sort of scaling this down to a couple points, one thing that they did, taking advantage of uh, something that the state allowed, was to set a fee uh, per credit for distance learners. Now, net, if you're totally studying online, your your fees are less than they are for campus. But if you're online, you do have this one fee, which is uh, for online students. And they plow a lot of that money, and it's a considerable amount of revenue, back into supporting and improving good instruction. Mm -hmm. In fact, every faculty member who's about to teach an online course for the first time is the recipient of around $20,000 of help in training and instructional designer support uh, and they can go on using that instructional designer kind of support you know as long as they're at the, at the institution it's sort of like a lifetime consulting contract that they can call on uh, and since all of their faculty are campus faculty they don't have a specialized oh i only teach online courses group it means that some of these same good instructional practices are uh, increasingly in use um, on campus. Uh, and I'll just conclude by saying that at this point, 20 years later, because the volume of training has been so high, roughly two thirds of all UCF faculty have had this kind of training sometime in the last 20 years. Wow. Wow. Two thirds. Yeah. That's rich. Over to you, Brian. Well, would you consider this to be a, a great success story? And the model? I do. I do. And I think it was um, another important thing I'd say about it is that they had aims for students learning well, for getting access to students who might not otherwise have it, uh, and for remaining as affordable as possible. And all three of those goals then shaped um, what it was that they were doing and how they were doing it. The sense of institutional mission in this area, which was uh, very strongly backed by the president of the institution and by the people in the various vice, pres vice presidential uh, level posts, including provost and of course, CIO. You mentioned the role of the state. So the state either uh, supported this or, or uh, didn't refuse to support it. Yeah, what the state had done in this case was simply to say at some point, I don't remember when it was, uh, I'm sure it wasn't as long ago as 20 years ago, but the state gave public institutions the right to charge a distance learning fee uh, per credit. Uh, and it was that revenue source uh, that uh, UCF was taking advantage of. And by the way, as part of their drive to try to keep things as affordable as possible, the state gave a maximum to what that fee could be. And they're only charging, I think, half, maybe two thirds of, of that maximum. Mm -hmm. So they're they're leaving money on the table. Wow. Okay, so this is the, this is the opposite of Florida man. Uh, this is actually something that's uh, spectacularly good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've got the commitment to teaching online as parity to face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. About the fee structure, uh, which then leads to extensive professional development support. Let, let me, let me uh, re, uh, re, repeat your question from before, um, Steve. Does anybody else have a similar story uh, at one of their institutions, either one where you're working with now or one that you've worked with in the past where they've managed to structure online teaching that well? Uh, here, again, you can type in the chat box, you can type in the questions, um, you can click the raised hand. If that's not enough, I'm just gonna slap a little open mic here on the stage. Um, so if you just wanna crash onto the stage with Steve and I, just press that button and you should pop on up uh, just as easy as can be. So I'll give people another minute to think about this. Uh, and if you're just joining us now, I'm looking at folks like uh, Julie, Abby, and uh, uh, Vivian. Um, if you haven't heard before, we're just uh, right now, and Ruben, hello Ruben. Uh, we are right now, this hour, having an organic discussion about the topic of how to teach well. 
And let's see, we have uh, uh, Kirsten Colvin Woodruff uh, has a point of view. Um, before I get to that, hello, Anne. Hello. Nice. To <laughs> I'm I'm thrilled to hear about UCF. Um, I I think that they probably hit the nail on the head with faculty support and development as being the key to uh, successful distance education programs. Um, I teach in a at the University of Maine at Augusta, which is mm -hmm. a distance organization, and they have a lot of support for faculty, and it really makes all the difference. We can't expect faculty to innately understand how to teach online. Yeah. Uh, and there are people who specialize in this and they should be uh, there. There should be enough of them available to, to help faculty. Well, that's great. How, how do they support this? I mean, I know the University of Maine system has had financial stresses for the past few years. Uh, how are they managing to afford it? That's a very good question, <laughs> and I really don't know that, um, but I would like to uh, find that out. Um, and uh, that I'm, I'm actually a doctoral student, too, right now. Um, what do you study? And, uh, distance education, uh, higher education, instructional design. Right. So, yes, yeah, so I would like to find out some of these funding mechanisms that different universities are using um, to provide the personnel because I think it's the personnel that really are important. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Anne, can I, can I keep you on stage for a few minutes more? Sure. Thank you, and I, I just love that um, uh, you and Steve are hundreds if not thousands of miles apart, uh, <laughs> and yet you have similar background windows, um, and perhaps even similar trees. Um, I'm, I'm, cl I'm close to uh, Anne in another way. Back in 1990, uh, when I was with the Annenberg CPP project, we gave a grant to the University of Maine Augusta to start that system. Really? Uh, yeah. And one of the things I learned from it uh, was that people referred to it sometimes as the instructional television network, because yeah. at that time it was a two-way video link with uh, high schools where students yeah. around the state would congregate. But I thought that was really misleading because the that was not the only technology that was involved. And the one that really impressed me in 1990 was that the students um, from around the state had seamless access to a, a unified library system, which included all the university libraries, the public university, the public library system, and Bowdoin and Bates, I think. Mm -hmm. So there was yeah. a single search interface and no matter what it was you chose, it would be mailed to you to, to the high school or whatever where you were. Uh, so they really had, uh, even though technically I imagine all the other campuses had the same access for them, the assumption would be, well, really the real libraries are the resources that we've got right here. Um, so they, they have done a great job with student supports like that, um, yeah. that uh, academic distance library services. Um, we also have virtual tutoring that we've been doing for students for, uh, oh, about 10 years now. Um, we have virtual uh, tutors to uh, work with our distance learners. And uh, in addition to that old fashioned ITV, it's now sort of morphed into a high flex model where students can join from home uh, from Zoom. So mm -hmm. uh, it it has expanded. Uh, so thank you for helping us get started. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It was an early illustration of the, of the fact that's become more obvious since that there are ways in which uh, online education can be superior to campus bound education. And having that sort of the world is my library uh, which 30 years ago was not an easy way to think. Uh, yep. that, that was one of the, one of the way, one of the first things I saw in that direction. And a rural place, mean, I see this as an issue of equity Definitely. that, you know, if we want to allow people access to higher education, we have to bring higher education where they are. We can't expect people to, you know, working adults and, and parents, you know, to, to travel hours to get to a campus they need to have access to it in their home. Yeah. Well, this is definitely a major theme for uh, for our time. Um, and 
And Steve, let me uh, let, let me keep you on stage for your reactions because we've gotten a few different, uh, uh, or and I can ask you again in text if you like. Um, uh, we have we've had a few Sorry. different. Uh, welcome back, welcome back. Uh, we've had uh, we've had a couple of comments that I wanted to run past you. Uh, one came from, uh, I believe it's Kirsten Colvin Woodruff, who says, uh, "At my university, we're given a five week online class that teaches us to teach an online class." Uh, Kirsten, thank you for sharing that. If you could tell us, you know, where is this? Which uh, school is it? Uh, let me put it to the two of you uh, first, Anne, and then Steve. Would that be uh, a, a good um, a good way to uh, skill up professors to be able to do this? What do you What do you think, Anne? And might be frozen. If Anne is frozen, Steve, why don't you take a run at it? Uh, yeah, I think it. I think it is one aspect of the of the UCF training. It's uh, about eighty hours of faculty work spread over. I'm not sure what long period of time, but with that with a that much work being done by faculty, you can imagine they really can get into things deeply. Um, and it's one of the reasons I believe that it's not just a matter of making online education comparable to what's always been there on campus, but to make the online and the revenue stream that's associated with online, a lever to improve the quality of all teaching that's associated with that institution. So the, you know, the rising tide is lifting both boats, campus and online. So in the case of uh, UCF, you had that built in uh, uh, fee structure, uh, which did that. Mm -hmm. um, so good, good. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Kirsten. Uh, and if you don't mind massacring your name, uh, thank you for uh, offering that. Um, we had uh, uh, Rebecca uh, Frazzi. Uh, Rebecca, if you, uh, uh, I can beam you up on stage um, if you'd like to. In fact, I'll just do that now, um, just to uh, uh, see what we can hear from you. Rebecca. That would be great. Can, can you hear me OK? I can hear you, but I can't see you. Unless, unless you know, I, I, I feel terrible, but I cannot go on video right now. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Well, your, your voice is fantastic. Um, is, is that okay? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I am a lecturer at San Diego State in the Learning Design and Technology program, and I personally have taught online for over 15 years. Uh, and so for faculty development um, at San Diego State, when we had to pivot to online, one of the success factors was that the California State system decided early on that the fall would be fall of 2020 would be fully online. So then we scrambled the jets and created a pretty robust faculty development program that was a scaled down version of something we already had going on that's similar to what you all were talking about at UCF, which we called the um, Course Design Institute. And so normally um, faculty were able to go through the Course Design Institute that happened over an entire semester and they would have an instructional designer kind of coach them through redesigning their course to teach online. The, um, the scaled down version that we put together was a cohort model over the summer. We offered two, I believe it was four week sessions, three or four week sessions. Um, we put over a thousand faculty through this faculty development experience over the summer. And the, some of the key aspects of it included um, a, a live synchronous Zoom session like this with all participants. And then we broke all the faculty into smaller pods, like learning pods. And each pod would have a faculty peer mentor. So it was the peer mentor was somebody who had already been teaching online or who already had been through the more robust Course Design Institute. And that person served to sort of guide and coach and answer questions to that small pod of faculty and try to create some community among that that smaller group. And then there were self-study modules in, in the Canvas learning management system because, oh, by the way, at the same time, we were migrating from Blackboard to Canvas. So um, it was, I would consider it sort of an action learning 
um, experience where the faculty were taking four um, required mods modules and then four electives so that they could take electives like uh, in video quizzing or using Google Suite in your class and different things that might be more applicable to their needs. Um, and then they went through those self-study modules with the peer mentor. Um, and, um, and then we also had drop-in virtual, I guess it would be like a virtual um, help desk that's open, not 24 seven, but probably 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. and with a click of a button you're in a zoom or like this experience with the instructional designers on staff so the participants could at any moment if they were struggling drop in and immediately get assistance from those instructional designers oh that's a serious institutional commitment mm -hmm. it was a serious it was a serious commitment and the the, uh, the culture, the, the situation at San Diego State is also that um, the faculty at San Diego State are under union contract. So they um, got that it was required that they would get stipend or, you know, to participate in this program. So there was a huge monetary investment. Um, I believe it was probably close to a million dollars and uh, to yeah pay the faculty for their hours going through the program. Uh, and then we also paid the faculty peer mentors um, and so forth. And we're actually going to re, so we had two cohorts go through in the summer and we're actually going to offer it again over the winter break because there were some faculty who weren't teaching in the fall of 2020, but now they're teaching in spring of 2021. So they, we didn't really have the capacity to have them go through in the summer, so they're gonna we're gonna redo it this winter um, with a smaller group. That's um, that's a fantastic story. This is San Diego State, right? Yes, and in fact, I think that this program will be showcased through Educause as a sort of success case study, and I'm not sure how that's being shared, but um, you'll be able to learn more about it through Educause. This is great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, Certainly. Thank you. Being in California, please stay safe from this pandemic. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, I'm, friends, I'm tweeting out uh, some notes about this, and it looks like we're building up a pretty good outline about how best to uh, support the campus. Um, what I'd like to do now is to uh, dive into a theoretical framework for this. Uh, I'd like to um, bring up two people on stage, um, both of whom uh, have uh, a lot of interest in um, Diana Lorillard's uh, theories about how best to teach online. Uh, one of them is a colleague of hers, uh, Zachary Spire, um, who is a postdoctoral research uh, associate. I want to say he's at University of College London. Am I right, Zach? Yep. All right. All right. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Glad to see Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. And hang on one second, because I also want to bring up uh, another huge fan of Lorillard's work. Uh, this is uh, Tom Hames coming to you from the Houston area, Texas, the United States. Uh, and he's a long-term friend and supporter of the program. Glad to see you, Tom. Hi. So, um, oh, um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I was going to say, you know, both of you have written to me, um, including during this conversation, about how you, you wanted to expand on uh, Diana Lorillard's ideas about uh, distance learning that speak right to what we're talking about. And I'm wondering, Zach, if because your name starts with Z, you're accustomed to going last. Uh, I thought I would, I would put you up first. Um, also, I was going to suggest the same thing. <laughs> I also have the beard starting up, and I, I want to support that. <laughs> it's the light reflecting from the top of the head that really does it for me. But there's a halo. That's what gives me the cachet. There you go. Well, um, welcome, Zach. That could a good uh, good day, colleagues. Um, yes, my name is Zachary Spire. I am a postdoctoral researcher and the UCL Bartlett Faculty of the Built Environment in the Global Center for Learning Environments. Um, and Diana Lorillard is a colleague of mine from the Institute of Education where I did my doctoral work. Um, and I actually am on the opposite side of the field from her in um, that I study how the built environment and education interface. And I'm 
I'm constantly challenged to understand the convergences and divergences um, it, sort of surrounding facilities-based educational approaches and Ooh. online teaching and learning. Um, what I love about Diana's work and Professor Lowe's work is she is very um, data driven, but the data is not just, okay, number of, you know, glutes and seats and number of people who turned up and number of people who logged in and number of comments and sections. She's very much someone who tries, I think, to understand the social relationships that underpin the quality of the outcome for both uh, students, their peers, um, and teachers and their pupils. And I think what interests me the most about her work is her evaluation of the effort and energy that people who are doing and facilitating teaching and learning online are having to now invest to maintain a, a sort of um, expectation of what their what their students are actually going to be able to do, um, how to engage students. Um, my sort of primary theoretical or conceptual lens is student engagement. So I'm primarily concerned about how staff and students um, engage each other and where they do that and why where they do that affects the formal informal like learning and living paradigm um, and i think for me professor Lorillard is just kind of an icon in the sense that she is driving questions around how do you assess and evaluate students and and faculties teaching learning and research in these different modalities that uh, in many res in many respects, in many sense, reflect the human social activity that is education, right. um, but also, as I say, uh, extend it beyond the traditional norms or the traditional paradigms we've been using and underpinning all of this work um, without necessarily throwing them out with the bathwater. Because what I find, fr frankly, happens a lot is it's an either-or conversation a lot. It's either it's a parity or either it supplements or either it complements facilities-based education, which is my expertise. And I, I'm, I'm always wondering how people, how people explore beyond that sort of dichotomous work or, and think, I think, more critically about the alternatives, if you will, the lines of flight. Yeah. Oh, yes, nice yeah. uh, closing in that there, very good. Um, thank you, thank you, Zach. Sure. Um, why don't you join in? So, yeah, that's actually a nice segue to what I've been working on for the last, uh, for, for probably the last year around this. And that is, you know, one of the things that I like about Lorillard, as you, as Zach just uh, uh, enunciated rather nicely, is that she really strips this down to those relationships, those conversations that are happening uh, between the students, among the students, between the student and the professor. And as I like to say, the most important conversation that she also uh, puts in there is the conversation that's happening between the students' ears. Um, and if we can, you know, the, the the articles that I dropped into the chat are ones that I have used over the last year um, as I've started to try to build up from those conversations and to look at both physical spaces, because I've done a lot of work with learning design as well. Uh, but also, you know, their analogies in online spaces um, and and how all of those, you know, stripping them down to, OK, what does this particular tool do in terms of those conversations? What kind of conversations does it promote? What kind of conversations does it get in the way of? Uh, and I've applied this to my own classes as well as a way of deconstructing all the little bits and pieces of those conversations that are happening within my classes mm -hmm. and saying, is this tool appropriate for this or is this tool appropriate for that? Um, mm -hmm. And I've used this over the last year uh, on a number of levels. Uh, the one, one was uh, one is a project that I've, is, is a little bit uh, is a little bit more fallow than I like it at the moment because I've <laughs> juggling too many balls, but the teaching tool set triangle where I basically took uh, the different types of instructional modes and tried to connect them up with uh, both virtual and physical tools for realizing those. And there's a, that's, uh, I'm doing that through the Shaping EDU project at Arizona State. Um, but another part of this is as we've kind of been, uh, it's been a little bit of a victim of the pandemic because I'm working on a book around that which I'm literally finishing up today, I hope. Uh, it should be out in a few weeks about strategies for teaching in the pandemic based on um, deconstructing all of these tools and saying, okay, the digital world works different. So where can we get advantages from the digital world? Where do we get advantages from the physical world? This isn't about compromise. And I get, I become increasingly frustrated with this dichotomy between online 
and in person. I think everything needs to be thought of as a hybrid. Uh, and that those hybrids should not be in fixed in bounds, so to speak. I and mean, one of the things we like to do with hybrids is uh, to say, okay, well, this is a way we can get twice as many classes into the same space. You know, you meet half the time online, you meet half, no, okay. That's the wrong way to think about it because you can't teach half a class one way and half a class the other. You have to look at all of the different pieces and say, okay, how do I assemble this in such a way where I'm maximizing the affordances of online and then maximizing the affordances of the limited amount of in-person uh, synchronous time that I have with my students, whether it's in this Zoom-like format, I'm sorry, I used to do shindig-like format, uh, uh, video conferencing format, or whether it's a, um, whether we're sitting around a table in a room uh, or a very large table in a room, socially distanced and so on. And by looking at my own classes, I mean, I figured out that I really only need about 20% in-person time uh, or face-to-face -face synchronous time. If I'm very honest with how much time gets wasted in those in those classes with me repeating the same things over and over again, when I can record that as yes. a video and put it in my class and they can watch it over and over again. And I, and I get it right every time, as opposed to when I do this in class, I go from one class to this because I forget something and it's always a little different, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, those kinds of things and thinking very carefully about the task that we're trying to achieve, the ends that we're trying to achieve right. as teachers and students, and then putting those together, using her framework to build up from there and everything else kind of flows out from, from, from that, from that idea of how do we, you know, we strip it all away. And, and I think that, Often when we talk about online education and technology and education, we get too focused on technology and the tools and lose sight somewhat of the purpose. Uh, just because something is cool doesn't mean it's good. And, uh, and some things require uh, marination. Some things require uh, uh, some time of use to, to the where they're mature enough to use. So Tom, that's another thing to bear in mind. Yep, go ahead, sorry. No, it's okay, my apologies for a second. The string of ideas is great because it comes out of your engagement uh, with uh, with Lord's work. Um, if I could ask, if you could put a link to your uh, teaching triangle in the chat, uh, and I can I sure. can tweet that out uh, so people can see it. Um, I guess one question I would have for the two of you, as uh, as uh, Laura Lard um, allies, uh, is how do you see her conversational framework applying uh, to teaching online now in twenty twenty? More so than ever, that's what I would say. <laughs> yeah, and and if I if I if I could, Brian, sorry, I I would just say I think the conversational framework is is now so important. In part because I wish we would spend a bit of time making space for the importance of informal engagement with one another and the fact that mm -hmm. there's some almost constant um, motivation to find some co-creative, co-constructed space, even in online settings. And the, the permission we must give ourselves as teachers to be learners all the time. And in doing so, constantly then, ergo, extending that to our students is as critical as ever. I think when I, when I hear about how we create these, we record these, we share these, we do this, and we want some consistency. And I totally appreciate consistency, but life is nonlinear and often inconsistent. And part of, mm. I think what Diana Lorillard's conversational approach gives me is the alternative view to say, look, I'm not gonna be the same person all the time. I have multitudes, as one before me once said, and I'm not gonna be secure. And there's gonna be things that evolve. And there's going to be moments when I don't get it right and moments when it's not clear or it's incomplete. And I'm a human being. And I think what's really important about Lorillard is the same thing that I derive from somebody like Ronald Barnett. Barnett's work is critical to giving sort of the permission to oneself that learning is an ongoing life course activity. Um, what you do with it is your own. I mean, what you, how you apply it, I think, is left to the individual mm -hmm. agency. But I, I think for her, the sort of value of informal, the value of, of what some have called serendipity, the value of seeing learning as a co-created thing that requires a sort of engagement on all sides to, to make the project work is actually super mm -hmm. critical right now. 
this is yeah, uh, and, and I would I would second so real quick. I would second that one of the biggest deficits that we're dealing with this year with online learning is the fact that many of the online platforms are poorly suited to serendipitous informal learning. We do not have the couches in the hallways in our learning management systems. And that is something we desperately need. I've tried to build them into my own courses, but it's always kind of off. It's the couch off in the strange closet somewhere <laughs> as opposed to you know, front and center. Um, and so, um, uh, that's absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's, that's something that's a real deficit. Um, the students that, that, the, the agency involved in students getting together as opposed to tripping over each other is, is, is difficult to pull off online. And we need to really think hard about how we're going to work, how we design for that. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a challenge just, to all uh, those LMS people out there. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Exactly. I think this is shared the, a link to uh, Ronald Barnett's um, uh, homepage uh, in chat and on, on Twitter as well. Um, Abby Johnson notes that students at Antioch just requested this from our academic technology team. Um, okay, I'm going. I want to. Uh, I want to clear the stage a bit. With more opportunity for more people to join us, but let me thank the three of you for doing. It. Especially like the fact that Zach, you managed to pair your uh, shirt color to Tom's uh, background. Very, go very Bruins! <laughs> well, please go ahead, Steve. Jump in. Yeah, just a final comment on the on the string that we were just in. The uh, I agree that when we're talking about online courses, we need to be thinking in a very fresh way about what it is that uh, our learning spaces make easier or make more difficult. Uh, Alongside that, though, we've got students in many cases who've been through years of different kinds of faculty teaching them in similar ways, delivering content, um, and testing them in similar ways. And, and that that kind of culture is not actually what we need for universities to work better. Uh, and that things like... Um, learning how to conduct the conversation in your head, learning how to have a thoughtful asynchronous discussion with other people sure. are skills that are related to um, using e-portfolios to name hmm. one high impact practice. Yeah. So the, I think that the job of w what kinds of um, habits of mind that students need to develop in a modern university needs to be a coordinated attack. Um, that it can't just be left to each individual faculty member saying, you know, well, what would be worth it just in terms of my course? Uh, so to choose a, a more concrete thing, let's imagine that a faculty member is saying, I want students to do projects in my course. And um, ideally, it would be great if they could do some um, video editing and building multimedia uh, project online. Yeah. But of course, I can't do that because just my one little course is not going to provide the justification any way you look at it for students to go from zero to being good at that. But if as a program, you think by the time our students are in their last year, we want them to be ready to do this or to think that way or to reflect this way, you can design the program to make it more and more likely that large numbers of students will be, in fact, ready to study and think in the ways that you need them to be by the time they're in their last semester. That That's well said, Steve. That that reminds me of um, in part of Tom Hames's abjuration that we think about the end here. Um, yeah. Getting them to the point where they can think about this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, uh, bring up um, a question that came much earlier from the uh, splendid Helen Williams. Uh, and she asked us a question that uh, I don't think we've touched on yet as quite as much, although Steve, you just came up to it, uh, which is how about strategies for supporting student group work and collaboration in an online environment, uh, which is a broad topic. And I'm wondering if anyone wants to jump in on that right now. Uh, Steve, you can take first dibs if you like. Um, but the question is, how do you support student group work and collaboration um, in the online environment? And so if anyone wants to jump in on chat, or if you want to join us on stage, just hit the join podium button, um, or uh, send us a, a, a note. Uh, we'd be glad to uh, share that with everybody. 
And in fact, if that's giving you all something to think about, uh, if that's giving you something to chew on, let's see. People are thinking you can hear like smoke beginning to rise um, from uh, from people's uh, from people's ears. Um, and we have Anne. Welcome back, Anne. I think she may be having a bandwidth issue, um, and you might want to just restart this page um, or kill some extra tabs. Um, we have a. Uh, um, a note from um, Sally. Uh, here, let me just put this up on stage so you all can see this. Uh, so Sally uh, Muriamu, who says, the university is being asked to prepare students to be digital professionals. This speaks to the comments of our speakers. Uh, yes, it does. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Hello, Fred. Well, hi there. Uh, I've been a follower of yours and, and admire what you do, and um, I appreciate what everybody's doing here today. Um, at Little Defiance College in D Little Defiance, Ohio, uh, we made a shift to online. Our vice president for academic affairs realized this summer that this fall could be very different. We didn't know exactly how to make it, so we start off hybrid, we eventually had to go remote, but she wanted to require all our faculty, and I only am talking about 38 of us, <laughs> to be trained for online teaching. And I'm also the director of our Center for Effective Teaching. So I was able to design a course using Moodle, our uh, platform, but I designed it intentionally so that the faculty who took it were online students learning about online teaching hmm. and um the the beauty of it being uh, a small school they uh they they wrote all their um responses and i was able to read them and give them feedback and um as i know my colleagues well enough i had the minimalists who um, i could tell were begrudgingly typing away and other people um grabbed it and ran with it but I was really impressed with the materials um, from Quality Matters because I had taken the Quality Matters courses, uh, mm -hmm. impressed with the uh, AQ um, toolkit and using that. And then we had our own tutorials from our technology person about how to use Moodle. And I felt the um, it took about three hours, but with the feedback I could give them, it was asynchronous that when we did have to go remote this, this semester for a couple of weeks, people were prepared. And, um, but people, some people really got it. Oh, you're making me be a student in learning how to do this. <laughs> Cause I had the course set up and they had to go through it and submit. And I gave them feedback like I would a good professor trying to do it as soon as possible. And, I think a few of them grasped the idea of what I was trying to do, the kind of the meta work. And um, I felt it went well. And uh, also it was good for me because I really got to know my uh, colleagues much better that way. So thank oh, you. Good. Oh, that's great, Fred. Thank you. That's a great story. I'm impressed that uh, Little Defiance was able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, well, here, let me, let me keep you up on stage just for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question that came up from the uh, splendid Maria Rankin Brown, a dean at Pacific Union College, uh, and she had a question which really might speak to you on this. Um, this is: uh, Anyone have advice on how to best mitigate for students' expectations that online learning be entertaining? Because of the medium they associate a screen with entertainment. Now, I'm curious, Fred. Did that did that come up in your discussion, or can you uh, even show the wise any of your colleagues' thoughts on that? Well, um, in terms of entertaining, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, what we taking from the quality matters um, rubric, we, I really emphasized how do you keep students engaged with you? How do you keep students engaged with the content? How do you keep students engaged with each other? And so I wouldn't necessarily call those multiple means of engagement as entertainment, but it kept the course, you kept thinking of different ways that you could, using the UDL, the Universal Design for Learning, different ways to express the content. What are different ways they could engage with it? And I, I think they, they 
students found that more entertaining than just, okay, you're going to show me a snazzy video. Um, I think the AQ folks, particularly like um, Flower Darby was very good on saying, you know, when we get online, we suddenly get very stiff. Um, we feel it's production or something. Just be your, be yourself like you are in the classroom. Be yourself online. And I emphasize that too to my, to my colleagues. And I think that freed them up. Again, we can be entertaining in our videos. I actually had a colleague who would um, start some things off a little knock-knock joke <laughs> because she sort of does that in class or, you know, just different things. Um, but what I learned is just as you are in the class, be that online. If that's entertaining enough, that's fine. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred, very much. Um, that's uh, that's great advice. Maria, thanks you in the chat. Uh, that's just what we need to hear. Uh, friends, we're almost at the end of uh, the hour. So let me, uh, let me clear the decks a bit. Steve, thank you for being a great respondent. Um, and thank you for beginning uh, our conversation. Uh, I want to bring up uh, an old friend and dear colleague uh, from Rollins College in Florida, a political economist, political scientist, named Tom Lerson. And he wanted to speak to the particular angle that liberal arts colleges have to bring on teaching online. So let's see if we can beam Tom up. Hello, Tom. Oh, boy. How are you? Oh, it's great to see you. Good to see you, too. So I. I will try to be very quick here since we don't have much time, but I do want to mention that uh, Brian and I go back for a long time in uh, teaching online. We first taught a course online across two separate institutions in 1998. Three institutions, right? But just with me and us, you and I. And then it's repeated that again in 2001. And I uh, taught a course across two institutions with two courses between Rollins and a university in India in 2014, along with several other experiences. So I'm, you know, I'm not unfamiliar with this event. And the point I want to bring up, which I think is a less positive one that I'm pleased to hear from everyone else, which is that liberal arts colleges may have an especial difficulty in making this transition. I know that was certainly true in the years that I was teaching at Rollins. I retired in 2016. And as I have talked to my colleagues since then, the COVID experience of forcing most of them online has not always been very successful. And that has been true both from the faculty perspective of how do you do it, but also from the student perspective of saying, you know, look, in the case of Rollins, we're paying fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year to go here, and we didn't pay that kind of money to take a course online. That comes from the parents and from the students. And uh, I'm wondering whether anyone has any success stories, I guess, in overcoming those kinds of issues uh, in their institutions. That's a fantastic question, Tom. And uh, you know, I tell people about the classes we taught, and they think that I'm describing science fiction or alternate history. Um, but uh, we broke a lot of ground. Does anybody have any experience they'd like to share uh, from that liberal arts uh, experience angle where uh, people have a, a difficult time uh, trying to grapple with that? Um, I mean, I'd, I'd recommend uh, the work of uh, Stephen Greenlaw at, uh, at uh, Mary Washington, University of Mary Washington. Uh, he's an economist who's been doing a lot of great work uh, with everything from open uh, content uh, to students co-creating classes. Um, Tom, if uh, anybody uh, shares anything, I will bring this up to you uh, straight away. Um, okay, thank, you. thank you, Tom, and stay safe. Uh, friends, we are at the last a minute of our normally scheduled program, um, and which is kind of shocking. It means that we have barreled through uh, a very, very important idea um, without um, a guest, but doing this organically ourselves. And I think everybody involved in this conversation should feel really good about that. Um, we have a lot of ideas. We've shared a great deal of content. Um, I want to point out that we have a lot of resources in the chat 
um, uh, Vivian Forsman just shared one book, for example, just a minute ago. Uh, we have some great questions. Um, so what I'd like to do, uh, with your permission, is to uh, scrape off and export the uh, questions uh, and put them in a blog post. And I will attach to the blog post as well today's recording uh, so that you can go and see what covered this. Will that work for all of you? Just let me know in the chat or uh, by chatting to me. Um, and Giancarlo, oh, thank you for sharing that. It's good to see you. Very good to see you. Uh, Vanessa Vale points out, we are the leaders that we've been waiting for. You are indeed. You are indeed. All right. Well, in that case, let me thank you all for participating uh, in an experiment uh, that we all made together. Uh, I'm really grateful to you for your creativity, your patience, and uh, for doing all this work together. Uh, Co-creating is sometimes the best way uh, to proceed. Uh, now, next week, uh, we have no future Transform session scheduled because it's Thanksgiving in the United States. Uh, and that's going to uh, take us off, and we can't compete with that. Um, so we're going to resume uh, the week after that, and we have a whole series of great programs. Um, you all have heard of them. You've all seen them, I know. Uh, so let me just mention a, a couple of details uh, going ahead. Uh, one of them is that uh, we are going to be covering a whole series of topics for the next few months. Um, if you want to keep talking about these topics, we have all these social media platforms that you can participate in. Uh, if you'd like to go back into the more than 230 recordings, uh, just go to tinyurl.com slash fdfarchive and you can dig in. And above all, let me just ask you to all please stay safe. In certain parts of the world, uh, COVID-19 is taking off. Uh, and this is a very, very dangerous time. Um, we value all of your lives and want to make sure that you are safe and sound. Please stay in touch with us online, and we'll see you next time. Take care, friends. Bye-bye.